for this section. We introduce the notion of equivalence of representations, and we give further examples. Recall we have G of finite group. We'll have representations pi v, pi prime v prime. These are finite dimensional. Definition. I'll have a linear map L carrying v to v prime. We'll call L an intertwining operator, or G map, if L satisfies the following equation. So pi prime G times L is equal to L times pi G for all G in our group. Now, what's happening here? First, L is linear, so L is going to preserve the vector space structure, but because we have representations, okay, there's going to be G actions on both vector spaces, we want L to preserve the G actions. So that's what this equation here says. Now, the way to think of an intertwining operator, these are going to be the morphisms for representation theory. So these carry representations to other representations. Now, if our map L is invertible, then we can show that L inverse is also an intertwining operator, and we'll call L an equivalence of G representations. So in this case, we would say that pi and pi prime are equivalent. So this is going to be what we'll use to say whether two representations are equal or not. So if we can find an equivalence, then they're the same representation, just with different labels. Further, if our representations pi and pi prime are unitary, if I have the L preserves the inner products, so we have inner product on V prime, inner product on V, then we'll call L a unitary equivalence. Formally, we can use our definitions to set up equivalence relations and equivalence classes of representations. For instance, I'll say that pi and pi prime are related if and only if there exists an equivalence between them. I'll leave it to you to show that this relation is reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. Then the resulting equivalence classes, okay, a given class is going to consist of all representations that are the same up to our relabeling. Likewise, we can define a relation for unitary equivalence. Then a given class will consist of all unitary representations that are the same up to a relabeling. Now, if we consider the special case where we have equivalent one-dimensional representations, we'll see that equivalence is the same as being equal as functions from the group to the non-zero complex numbers. Now, if pi and pi prime are one-dimensional, well, we can choose bases for v and v prime That'll just mean we're looking at homomorphisms from the group G to the non-zero complex numbers. So if I have an intertwining operator that's also an equivalence, then L is just gonna be multiplication by a non-zero scalar. If we set up the definition of intertwining operator, the scalar cancels on both sides and we're left with pi equal to pi prime. So here equivalence is the same as equals. Now, in general, okay, we have the main result. We'll give the proof much later. For here, I want to give examples, and we might as well show that the examples that we give are exhaustive. So our result is, if I consider a set of inequivalent irreducible representations for our finite group G, I take the sum of the squares of the dimensions, that's equal to the order of the group. Now, let's run through some examples. First, let's consider the symmetric group on three letters. Okay, so this has six elements. Here I'm using cycle notation. We've seen these three before. First, we have the trivial representation. Okay, so this is one dimensional. Okay, we're always gonna act as the trivial action. Then we have the sign representation. So here we have the three cycles in the identity go to one, the two cycles go to minus one. Again, this is one dimensional. Then we have a two dimensional representation that's irreducible. So we've seen this in this form here. Here's our vector space in C3. Okay, so we're just gonna take some of the coordinates equal to zero. 
The group action just acts on the labels of the standard basis. This has dimension two. So we have one squared plus one squared plus four. It's gonna give me six. So by our theorem, that's everything. These are inequivalent because these are not equals functions. And then here, dimension is not equal to one of these. So that's gonna be everything, up to equivalence. Another way to think of the two-dimensional representation, I'll let V prime be equal to C2. I'll take an equilateral triangle centered at the origin in R2. Okay, I'll label the vertices as so. And then we'll let S3 act on R2 by permuting these labels. So for instance, 2, 3, it's gonna switch the two and the three. So we have reflection across the x-axis. With respect to the standard basis, we have the matrix one, zero, zero, minus one. For the element one, two, three, okay, that's gonna be rotation counterclockwise by two pi thirds. In the standard basis, we get the following matrix, and so on. Now, we could take the action on R2, extend it naturally to C2, That'll give us an irreducible representation of S3. So exercise, find the equivalence between this pi prime and the two-dimensional representation on the previous board. Next example, let's consider the modular integers z mod n under addition, where n is strictly bigger than one. Now z mod n is finite abelian, so we've seen that the irreducible representations are gonna be all one dimensional. To describe these, okay, we're gonna index each of these by a label in the set going from zero to n minus one. So I'll call that k. We'll define pi sub k going from z mod n to c star as follows. So I'm gonna take an nth root of unity, so e to the two pi i divided by n, and then we're just gonna raise it to the kth power depending on the k we're using for the index. Then, on the nth element, okay, in z mod n, we're just gonna raise to that power. Now, a few things we need to show here. Okay, off the bat, this m is just gonna be defined for the integers. So I wanna show well-defined. So I wanna show that if we take pi sub k on m, it's gonna be the same as if we take pi sub k on m plus or minus multiples of n. So that way it'll descend to z mod n. Then we have to verify the homomorphism property. And we can use the homomorphism property to show that there are no other elements besides the ones in this set. Finally, we wanna show that they're all distinct. And we can do that just by checking pi sub k on one. Now, with all these, we go to our main result and we just have the sum of one squared, n times is equal to n. Exercise, if you note, if I take pi sub k and pi sub l, we can multiply them together and then the effect is just to add the labels and then reduce modulo n. So if we take this as a multiplication, show that the set of all pi sub k form a group and that that group is isomorphic to z mod n. To extend our example, okay, let's just consider general G finite abelian. By the fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups, I can write G in the form, okay, so it'll be isomorphic to Z mod N1 cross Z mod N2, all the way up through Z mod N sub K. And we'll have that each N sub I divides N sub I plus one. Now, to define the irreducible representations for okay, this type of G, we just build it out of the ones for a single factor. So for instance, if I have Z mod N1 cross Z mod N2, I'll define pi of M1, M2, just to be, okay, we'll take pi K1, M1, pi K2, M2, where K1 is in the set from zero to N1 minus one, K2 is in the set from zero to N2 minus one. Now, this is gonna give us N1 times N2, irreducible representations of our group of dimension one. We go through our list from before to show that that's everything. And then we have K1 
Okay, our main result. We take one squared, add it to itself, n1 times n2 times. And that's gonna give us the order of the group. Exercise, repeat our exercise from here for a general finite abelian group. For another non-abelian example, consider D8, the dihedral group with eight elements, better known as the symmetry group of the square. For enumeration purposes, okay, we set up our square, put a one in the upper right-hand corner, and then we follow the labels going counterclockwise. So this labeling, we can write all of our elements like this in cycle notation. Now, in D8, we have three normal subgroups of order four. We could use this to get three one-dimensional representations for free. So what we can do, we'll pick one of these subgroups, First step is to pass the quotient group, and since this has two elements, we have a homomorphism to plus minus one in C star. So we send all elements in the fixed subgroup to one. All the other elements, so the elements in the other coset, go to minus one. Now, that'll give us three distinct homomorphisms in the C star. So we have four one-dimensional representations. We have the trivial representation, and then one for each of these subgroups. By the main result, we have space for a four, and we'll fill that up using a two-dimensional representation. So, like with the two-dimensional representation for S3, we'll just consider, okay, the action induced on the plane from the symmetries of the square. Then we'll extend that to C2. So for instance, I could send one, four, two, three. Okay, if you look at your picture, that's just gonna be reflection across the x-axis. So in the standard basis, we have the matrix one, zero, zero, minus one. Likewise, if I consider one, two, three, four, that'll be rotation by 90 degrees counterclockwise. So again, the standard basis, we have zero minus one, one, zero. Now, once you show that this is irreducible, Okay, what do we have? We have one squared plus one squared plus one squared plus one squared plus two squared gives us eight, and that's the order of the group. Next, let's consider the quaternion group. You'll note if we describe the representations of the quaternion group, then we'll have described representations for all groups up to and including order eight. Now, let's recall elements of the quaternion group, we're gonna have labels i, j, and k. We take plus or minus those, and we have plus minus one. The rule for multiplication, if we square any of our labels, we get minus one. If I multiply any two distinct labels together, okay, well, I'll label i, j, and k. If we multiply any two going clockwise, then we get the third. But going the other direction, we put in a minus sign. So we'll have these six products here. Now, for the irreducible representations, we work the same way that we did for D8. So here we're gonna have three normal subgroups of order four. We go to the quotient, we go to plus minus one. That gives us three one-dimensional representations. With the trivial representation, we'll have four of these, that leaves room for four, so that'll be taken up by an irreducible two-dimensional representation which we describe here. So for this last representation, okay, we're gonna use the poly matrices. So these are given as follows. Now note here we have an I coming from our group, and we have an I for the complex numbers, so you wanna make sure you don't mix those up. We need to check that that's irreducible, so leave that as an exercise. And then we note, okay, I have one squared plus one squared plus one squared plus one squared plus two squared gives me eight, as promised. We now have the machinery to answer the following question. How do we find all one-dimensional representations of a finite group G? Notation, another way to say one-dimensional representation is character but we need to be careful because we use characters in other places. So you have to pay attention to context. Now, the key to answering this is gonna be the commutator subgroup 
of our group G. And that leads to the abelianization, which is just the quotient of G by its commutator subgroup. Now recall, the commutator subgroup is going to be the subgroup of G generated by all elements of the form xy, x inverse, y inverse. We have the following exercise, or you can just review this. First, the commutator subgroup is a normal subgroup of G. Then, if n is a normal subgroup of G, such that the quotient g mod n is abelian, then we must have the commutator subgroup is a subgroup of n. What this means is that g mod, the commutator subgroup, is the largest abelian quotient. So that's why we call this the abelianization. So it's what happens if you take your group G, put in the relation xy equals yx for all x and y and g. Then, okay, for some concrete examples, work out the commutator and the abelianization for z mod n, s3, d4, and q. And then just verify one and two. Finally, what happens when g is abelian? What happens when G is simple? Okay, so if G is simple and abelian, we'll answer that in the first part. G is simple and non-abelian, we wanna consider something like A5, alternating group on five letters. Now suppose we have a character of G. So we have a homomorphism pi from G into C star by the first isomorphism theorem, with the G mod the kernel of pi is isomorphic to a subgroup of C star that means this quotient's abelian, so the commutator subgroup is contained in the kernel. That lets us factor our homomorphism as follows. So we're gonna go from G to the abelianization, then we're gonna go from the abelianization to G mod the kernel of pi, and then to C star. So to construct characters, we should look for normal subgroups that contain the commutator subgroup. So for the characters of S3, D8, and Q, you should verify that this works out. Now, to construct a character from scratch, what we would do, I'll start with G, we're gonna target a normal subgroup that contains the commutator subgroup, could be the commutator subgroup itself. We start by using the quotient map to go to the quotient group G mod N. Because that contains the commutator subgroup, it's finite abelian. Then we can use the fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups to write G mod N as isomorphic to a product of cyclic groups. From before, we've seen how to write all characters for groups of this type. So we compose with one of those. And that's how I get a character of G going to C star. Now, letting N be equal to the commutator subgroup of G, our main result implies that G will have G mod commutator subgroup of G characters. So if we're looking for these one dimensional representations, we now know how to count these. So exercise, verify these counts for S3, D8, and Q, and then do the work for A4 and A5. Okay, and so some help is, commutator subgroup for A4 is isomorphic to a Z2 cross Z2, for A5, the commutator subgroup is itself. 